Hey there! In this spy game tutorial, we're going to build this in-game menu framework by using game states. A lot of people seem to have enjoyed my tutorial on menus, so I thought it'd be useful to build upon some of those ideas and see how we can make an even more versatile system. By incorporating states into your game, it'll be a lot easier to handle things such as menus and changes in your core gameplay. So first, let's introduce the idea of states in a state machine. The idea is a little abstract, so let's start with a concrete example. When you turn on Mario, you don't just get thrown into the main game. We start at the main menu screen, then we go to the level transition, and finally we start platforming for the main gameplay. These are all different states, and how we interact with the game is going to depend on what state the game is currently in. So, for example, pressing a button may make Mario jump in the gameplay state, but do something entirely different in another. A state machine then describes how all of our different states work together. So going back to our Mario example, we start at the title screen state. Once the start button has been pressed, we go to the level transition state, and then after a bit of time passes, we enter the platforming state. So using the state machine, we are able to take all of our states and make them into a cohesive experience. Now let's see how we can code our own state machine from scratch using Pygame. And just a reminder, all of the complete code can be found on my GitHub. So if you encounter any issues, feel free to take a look there. The link is in the description. So go ahead and open up your favorite IDE. I'll be using Visual Studio Code, and we're gonna go ahead and set up all of our files and directories. But first things first, make sure you create this game.py file. It's gonna be the main file that our program runs from. And right now it's empty, but we're gonna fill it in shortly. Go ahead and create a directory called states, and we're gonna be using that later. You'll see how. And then assets, so there will be a link in the description. Make sure you click that and download the assets folder. It's gonna contain all the images and fonts that we're gonna to use to build this game. If you wanna follow along with me, make sure you download that and drag and drop it in here. And then you can ignore this VS Code folder. This is just my settings. So if you're using a different IDE or just VS Code, don't worry about it. Let's go ahead and start filling in game.py. We'll start by importing some important modules. So we're gonna need the OS and time modules, which should come built in with Python. And then of course, Pygame. Now let's make a class which we're going to call the game class and if you follow along with my menu tutorial then this is all going to look really familiar to you. With that being said I'm going to go through most of the stuff in this game.py file very quickly since a lot of it is stuff I've covered before. If you haven't seen my menu tutorial and are new to game programming I'd recommend you start by watching at least part one of it since I go over a lot of the basics of how a game actually works. There'll be a link in the description so consider checking it out and then coming back here. In short the purpose of this class is to encapsulate everything in our game. So it's easy for us to keep track of where everything is. So in our init function, the first thing we're going to do is call pygame.init, and this is just going to boot up all the necessary pygame things that we'll need. And then we're going to create a few variables for our game window. So the first set of variables here is the game width and game height. Our native resolution is going to be 480 pixels by 270. And this is essentially the measurements of our game world that we're going to need to keep in mind when we code our logic. So in terms of our game, we can display 480 by 270 pixels at a time, but that's pretty small, especially for most modern monitors. So what we're going to do is we're going to have all of our logic on a 480 by 270 screen and then upscale it from there. So the second variable pair is what we want to upscale it to. In this case, I'm just going to make the screen twice as big to 960 by 540. And then now we need to create our surfaces. This is going to be where we actually draw all of our game logic. It's going to be on the game canvas. And then once everything's drawn the way we want it to be, we're going to go ahead and put it on the screen, but we're going to put it on the screen at the resolution we want. Now let's create two Boolean variables. I'm going to call these self.running and self.playing. The self.running is going to see if the game is running, and the self.playing is going to see if the player is actually playing the game. And you'll see how these two come into focus later. Next, we're going to make a dictionary called actions. And what it's going to do is take in a key, so some sort of action, like are they pressing left or right, and return false if they're not, and true if they are. So right now everything is static, but you'll see how we edit this so that we can change those values. But for now, just copy it down. Next, I'm going to make these two variables, self.dt, which is short for delta time, and we're also going to keep track of the previous time. Uh, this is for frame rate independence, so if you're not familiar with frame rate independence, I recommend you watch my tutorial on it, and I'll link that down in the description. But otherwise, we're going to continue. So now I'm going to declare what I call the state stack, and this is going to be a list, but we're actually going to treat it as a stack. Python's lists are very versatile, so we can do that. And if you've never worked with the stack data structure before, don't worry, they're pretty simple and I'll detail them a little later, but it's actually going to be a really good choice to manage our game states. And uh, it's not the only way to do it, but for this game, it's going to be a, a very intuitive choice and you'll see why. Lastly, we're going to call the load assets function. It doesn't exist right now, but we're going to make it very shortly. That's everything in our init function. So now let's make a new function, which we'll call get events. This function will go ahead and check what buttons the player has been pressing. 
So for example, we're going to loop through everything that's been pressed. And if the event is equal to the little X at the top of the window, then we know that the player wants to close the game. So we're going to set the playing and running variables to false. We're going to want to apply the same logic to keyboard events. So if the event.type is pygame.key down, that means something was pressed on the keyboard. And we can check individually what key was pressed and what to do about it. A, D, W, and S are going to set the left, right, up, and down keys to true. And then we're going to use P and O as our action buttons and return or enter as our start button. We're also going to need to apply this logic to when a player lets go of the key. So if we see a key up event, then we're going to go ahead and set the action to false. So for example, if the player lets go of the A key, then we're going to set the left action equal to false. And we're going to have to do this for all of our events. So I'll go ahead and leave this up there on the screen for a little bit and you can go ahead and copy it down. Feel free to pause the video if you like. Let's make another function that we'll call update and we're going to fill it in later. So for now, just put pass. Our next function is going to be the render function. We're going to start by blitting our game canvas onto the screen surface. And then from there, we can scale it up to the screen width and height. So even though it starts off at an original 480 by 270, we can scale it up to whatever we need it to be. From there, we can do pygame.display.flip, and this will update the actual game window that we see on our screen. Right now, we haven't drawn anything onto our game canvas, so when we load up our window, you should just see a black screen. Next, we're going to create this getDT function to compute the delta time. I won't go over delta time here, so if you're not familiar with that or frame rate independence, I highly recommend you watch my frame rate independence tutorial that I will link down in the description, so make sure you do that. Next, let's include a function that will let us draw text onto the screen. So it's going to take in a couple arguments, the first one being the surface we want to draw the text on. This text argument is the actual words that we want to render, the color in form of RGB, and then an X and Y position for the text to be drawn on. This function uses a font that we will load up shortly, renders the text, and then puts it at the correct X and Y position. And then if you have some sort of font with weird transparency properties, this line right here might help. But if you're following along with me, just go ahead and comment that out for now and ignore it. Next, let's create this load assets function. What we're going to do here is we're going to create pointers to all of our directories so we can get them easily if we need to. And then we're also going to load up our font object by calling pygame.littlefont.bigfont and then putting in the file path of where our font is. In this case, our font is called press start to player some stuff .ttf. Then we can load up our font and we just include this extra argument. This is the size of the font, so we're going to have a size of 20. And as you can see, we're using the OS module to do all of this for us. So if we use os.path.join, it goes ahead and makes those file paths for us and it'll work across any system, which is why it's really useful. Now I'm going to go ahead and scroll all the way back up to the top. And then under the init function, I'm going to go ahead and put the game loop function. This is the main function that's going to continually run while our game is being played. So while it's played, we're going to compute the delta time, check for what the player has pressed, update the game according to those presses, and then render it all onto the screen, and do that over and over again until they're done playing. Now finally, let's make it so that the player can actually run our game from this file. So, if we go all the way to the bottom, and we put if double underscore name, double underscore is equal to double underscore main, double underscore, then we're going to create an instance of the game class, which we'll call g, and then while g is running, let's go ahead and run that game loop function. Now would be a good time to test if everything is working. So if you go ahead and run that game.py file, what you should see come up is this blank pie game window. And if you press this little X, you should be able to close it. If you're able to do that, then you're all caught up. Now that we've finished our game class, we can go ahead and start with the real meat and potatoes of this project. So go ahead and go to your states directory, and you're going to create a new file, which we'll call state.py. Inside the state.py file, we're going to put this state class. And this is going to be an abstract base class for all the other state files. So we're going to use this as basically a template. And we can illustrate this with a diagram. Our state class is going to be the base class that all of our other states inherit from. Because they're all children of the state class, they essentially all have the same DNA, and we can think of them as sort of a family. Because of these properties, we can place them together in data structures. All of these states are going to have an update and render function, but how they do it is going to depend on what state we're in. We can override these functions to fit our needs. So if our main gameplay is a platformer game, then we can place all of our platforming code inside that update function and render our game world in character. There's a clear difference between platforming and just looking at a title screen, but in the eyes of Python, all it knows is that the state is updating and rendering, so it's going to make it really easy to switch between states. Now let's talk about stacks real quick. Stacks are a really simple data structure that hold, add, and remove objects in a last-in, first-out order. 
When they add something or push it, it gets placed right at the top. And when they remove something or pop, they remove the top item. You can think of washing a pile of dishes. You have to wash whatever dishes on the top before you can wash any of the dishes on the bottom. So now let's combine our inherited states with the state stack and walk through what that might look like. When we start the game, it will add the title screen state onto the stack. The stack is going to update slash render whatever state is currently on top. Since we only have the title screen, that's what we're going to see. Now let's say the player presses start because they're ready to play the game. The gameplay state will then be placed at the top of our stack, and they'll be able to play the game because that's what's going to be updating and rendering. While they're playing, they open the menu and go to some sort of party select to check on the status of their current characters. So a few more states are added to the stack. Once they're done, they exit the party menu. Now the stack pops, and that party member state is gone. So we're back to the overall menu state that's updating and rendering. Once they're done with that menu, they close it and the stack pops again. Now we're back to updating and rendering the gameplay state. And you can see the power of how the stack works now. So with that understanding of how this is all going to work, let's go back to our state class and see what it contains that's going to help us. Our init function is going to make a reference to the game object. Because the game object encapsulates everything in our game, we'll have access to everything if we need it. We're also going to have a pointer that'll keep track of what state is currently below our current state. This might sound a little weird, but I'll show you an example of why this might be useful a little later. And then of course we have the update and render functions. These are going to be empty right now because we're in the abstract base class, but once we get to the more concrete children classes, we'll fill them in. For the update function, we're going to want to pass in that delta time variable from our game class, as well as the actions dictionary. And then for the render function, we're going to go ahead and pass in the game canvas. That's going to be the surface that we're referring to. The last two methods we're going to look at are the enter state and the exit state. And this is where we're going to use the stack. Enter state is essentially the push. So first, we'll check to see if the stack's length is greater than 1. If it is, then we'll keep track of the previous state and put it in the previous state variable. After that, we'll take our current stack and put it right at the top, and we'll do that using the append function for our state stack. So if this is the push, then exit state's going to be the pop, which is pretty self-explanatory, and Python lists have a pop method built into them already, so we can just go ahead and use that one. Now let's go ahead and make some states so we can actually see our game in action. Let's go ahead and make a new file, and we're going to call it title.py. In title.py, we're first going to import our state class from the states.py file, and we can do that with this line right here. Let's make a new class, which we'll call title, but put state in the parentheses, and that'll let Python know that we want to inherit from the state class. Now our title state is going to be really simple, it's just going to render some text onto the screen. So we're just going to borrow our init statement from our abstract state class, since it's pretty much going to do everything we need it to do. Just make sure to pass in a reference to the game, and we're good to go. Our update function isn't really going to do all that much right now. Eventually, it's going to handle transitions to other states, but because we only have the title screen right now, we just want to make sure that works. So let's just have it reset the keys. Lastly, let's handle our render. So we're just going to do a fill, and this is just going to fill the entire screen white, just so we know something's working. And then we're going to use the draw text function in our game class, and we're just going to draw the words game states demo right in the middle of the screen. Let's go back to game.py so we can make a few minor additions that will help us get everything working. So let's import our title class from states.title. Let's scroll on down to the update function. We need to render whatever's at the top of the stack, so we can do that like this. We're going to put brackets, and inside the brackets we're going to put negative 1. This is going to tell Python to check whatever's at the end of the list, which we can think of as the top of the stack. From there, we can call the dot .update method, pass in delta time in our actions dictionary, and everything else will be taken care of from there. Now we're basically going to follow the same logic using the render function. So we'll use negative 1 to get the top of the stack, we'll call the dot .render, and then inside, as a surface, we're just going to pass in game canvas. And last but not least, let's go ahead and make a function which we'll call load states. And what this is going to do is just make an instance of the title and then set that to the top of the stack. And then once you finish writing it, go ahead and place it at the bottom of the init function, just like this. So now that our state should be working in theory, let's go ahead and run the code to see what happens. If we run it, then we get this game states demo text right in front of us. So we know that the stack is correctly rendering and updating the right scene. Now that we have one working scene, let's go ahead and make another and see how they can work together. So let's go ahead and make a new file, which I'm going to call gameworld.py. This file is going to be where we actually code the gameplay state. 
So let's go ahead and start by importing some modules. We're going to want Pygame and OS. And then we're also going to want to get that abstract state class. So from states.state, .state, import state. And that'll get us access to it. Go ahead and create our game world class. So of course, we're going to say class game world, and we're going to inherit from state. And then the init's pretty much going to follow the same deal. We're going to declare an init, but then use the abstract state class as init, because it does a lot of what we need it to do. I'm just going to make one extra addition and actually load the background image, which is that grassy image you saw in the beginning. We're going to go ahead and load that using pygame.image.load and the os.path.join. From there, we can go into our assets directory and it's going to be in a folder under map. It'll be grass.png. Let's go ahead and get that ready. Now, because this is for demonstration purposes, I'm just keeping everything simple and loading a static background image. But if you wanted to, you could apply a tile map or something more complicated like that to this state. And that's how you could get more of those complex gameplay features. Go ahead and make an update function. Right now, it's not going to do much, but you'll see later when we add a player character and some more state transitions that we're going to need to add to this. And the last thing we're going to do for now is go ahead and make the render function. And then we're going to go ahead and blit that grass background image. And we can do that at 0, 0. It'll be the top left corner. And it'll take up the whole 480 by 270 screen. Now let's run back to title.py. And let's see how we can actually code in a state transition. So we can go from the title screen to the main gameplay. Let's start off by importing our game world state from the game world.py file. And we can do that with this line right here. So we're going to handle our state transition inside the update function. This is what it's going to look like. So if the player presses start, which we can check using the actions dictionary, then we're going to create a new instance of the game world, which we'll call new state. And we don't forget to pass in a reference to the game. We can do that with self.game. From there, we're going to run this enter state method. And basically what this does is add the new state to the top of the stack. And then when we go to the next frame, then the new state will render. Let's go see what that might look like in action. If we run our code, then we start here at the game states demo. And now I'm going to press enter. And now we can see our background. So we can see that the state transitioned correctly. Now let's head back to gameworld.py and we're going to make a class for the player character. Now, normally it'd be good practice to give them their own file so that our code is modularized. But for the sake of brevity, I'm going to place it here. Coding the player character isn't really the focus of this video. So I'm mostly going to gloss over it. What I'll do is copy and paste all the functions it needs and then briefly explain what they do. Once I'm done explaining, I'll give some time for you to pause the video and take your time writing it all out. As always, first thing we're going to do is the init function. So we're going to start off by making a reference to the game. We're going to create this load sprites function a little later, so hold tight for that. We have some variables to help keep track of the player's position. And then we have some variables that will help keep track of the player's animation. Let's go ahead and make a function that will update the player. First thing we're going to do is get direction from the inputs. And here's a pretty intuitive way of doing that. From there, we can multiply the direction, delta time, and a value of 100. And we can add that to the player's current position, and that'll move them. And then we have this animation function that we will take care of shortly. So go ahead and write that down as well. Let's go ahead and render our character. We're going to blit their current image, which does not exist yet, but we'll make it a little later at the position X and position Y. And that's about it here. So next we're going to include our animation function and this is going to be a bit of a longer one uh in brief we're going to use delta time to keep track of when the last frame was updated and then depending on the direction of the player we will update to their new frame now we haven't actually loaded in any of the sprites for those frames but we will do that shortly in the load sprites i'm not going to go through the theory of animation here but if you're interested i do have an older video on that that i can link in the description below And the last member function that we're going to include here is load sprites. Basically what this is going to do is go into our assets folder and then find all the images that relate to the player, load them all into lists so we can use them for animation purposes. Once you're done writing all that code for the player, you're just going to want to include him into the game world. So let's go ahead and make an instance of the player in our init function. We'll then place the player's update function inside the game world's update function that way the player is updating and then finally we'll render the player over that green background image by placing their render function right after the blit we run back over to our game.py file and go ahead and run it 
when we press enter you should see the little player come up and now you should be able to move them around and it looks like everything's working so hopefully you caught up now let's focus on making our pause menu so we're going to go to states we're going to create a new file and we are going to call it pause menu.py our pause menu is going to begin like every other state we've made so we'll import pi game in os we'll get the abstract base class states we're going to inherit from states and create our pause menu class and then we're just going to go ahead and use the state init function since it does pretty much everything we need except for a few things so before we worry about anything else let's just make sure that when we press enter that we'll actually see the pause menu on the screen so the first thing we need to do with that is we need to load it in so we're going to set the self.menu image do a pygame.image.load and then we're going to use that os module to find the menu.png file it's in the map folder in the assets directory and then from there we can use the get rec function that comes built in with python to get everything we need to know about the rec surface that the menu image png comes with and then we can go ahead and center it where we want it at this point i'm going to put the position at 0.85 times 480 and then 0.4 times 270 and that'll be a nice spot to put it at Let's go ahead and add the update function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check to see if the player has pressed the second action button. I'm going to treat this as like a back button. So if they do, then we're actually going to pop the pause menu and then it'll go back to the regular gameplay. Otherwise, we're just going to reset all the keys at the end of the frame. So if we want to see it, then we of course need to render it. And there's only one sort of tricky thing about this. So we're also actually going to have to render the previous state, which we can do because it has a pointer to it. We're going to call that render function and it'll give us that nice effect that you see in games like Pokemon where you can still see the overworld and the pause menu just kind of goes over it. After that, we're just going to go ahead and blit the menu image and just go ahead and stick the menu rec there and the position is already set, so it should be good to go. Now let's hop back over to our gameworld.py file. We want our new pause menu state to be able to communicate with the rest of our states. So let's go ahead and import it in gameworld.py. We're going to do states.pause menu and we're going to import pause menu from that. Now it's actually incorporated into our game. So we're going to go to the update function and then we're going to put this here. So first we're going to check to see if the player has pressed start. If they have, then we're going to create a new instance of the pause menu. We'll call it a new state. And then we just need to place it on top of the stack. So we'll do a new state dot enter state. This will set the pause menu to be the top of the stack and it'll render. Let's go ahead and make sure everything's working. So if we go to our game file, run that, we start off with our game states title screen. Once we press enter, we go into our overworld, and now when we press enter again, we should see this pause menu, and if I press O, it takes me back. So it looks like everything's good. So now let's go back into our pause menu, and let's go ahead and make a cursor so we can actually select different options in our menu. So if you watched my menu tutorial, you'll see that I, when I made the cursor, I just kind of hard-coded everything in, and that worked for the time, but let's think of a better solution. So we're going to make a menu options dictionary, and what it's going to do is it's going to take an integer as a key, and then it's going to correspond to a different option. So for example, key 0 is going to be party, key 1 is going to be items, key 2 is going to be magic, key 3 is going to be exit. And then we're going to set this index variable to let us know which one we're currently on. So if the index is set at 0, then we know where we should be at the party. So now let's create all the variables that we're going to need for our cursor. First thing we're going to do is just load in the image, and this isn't going to be terribly different from anything we've done. The image cursor.png is in the map directory in the assets folder. Next, we can use get rec to create a rectangle object using that image. And then after that, we're actually going to use the menus coordinates and we're going to offset it by 38. And this will be the position of the cursor. Uh, once we have the position of the cursor, we're going to set it to the rect. So we're going to offset in the x direction by 10. And then we're just going to leave it there. We don't really need to move it in the x direction since our cursor is just going to go up or down. Uh, for the y direction, we're going to set it to our cursor position y, and this value is what's going to change and allow the cursor to move up and down. Let's also make sure we render our cursor. So in our render function, after we render our menu image, we're going to render the cursor image over it. Now let's make a function that will actually let us move the cursor around. We're going to call it update cursor, and let's just see how it works. So first we're going to check to see if the player presses either up or down. If they do, then we're going to modify the value of index. So our index is either going to go up 1 if they press down, or it's going to be subtracted 1 if they press up. Next, we're going to mod the value of index by however many options there are in our options dictionary. And this is what's going to give us that nice looping behavior. So let me give you an example of how that's going to work. Let's say we go and start at party, and the player presses down. 
Next, we're going to go to items. Modding's not going to do much. Next, we go to magic. Not going to do much. Next, we go to exit. Now, if the player presses down and exit, we're going to get four. But when we mod that by the length of however many items, which is four, we're going to go back to zero. And it's going to take us back to party. And that's going to work the same way for up. The only difference is we're going to be subtracting one instead of adding one. And then once we've determined what our index is, we're just going to multiply it by some value. In this case, I picked 32. And we're going to take that and add it to our cursor position and then update the rectangle. And then from there, we'll have a nice behavior for our cursor. Let's go ahead and see it working in action. So first, we're going to take our update cursor function and we are going to place it inside our update function just like that. So let's hop on over to game.py and run our code. And then if we open the menu and we see that little red dot, that's the cursor. If I press S, which is my down key, it now sends the dot down. If I do it again, it keeps going down. Now if I do it on exit, then it loops back to party. And the same thing is going to happen with W, which is the up key. So everything seems to be working. So the last thing I want to show is how you can use the pause menu to transition to a different state. So let's make a new file, and I'm going to call it party.py. This would be some sort of a party menu. But for the purpose of not making this video too long, I'm just going to make a really simple state. So this is going to be our party menu. All it's going to do is just say party menu goes here, sort of as a placeholder. And then it's just going to follow most of the same rules we did before. So here we have our init function, and it pretty much just does everything in the abstract face class. So we're going to use that for our update function. We're just going to check to see if the player presses the action to button, which is the back button. If they do, then we're just going to pop the party menu state off the stack and then reset the keys every frame. And then lastly, we have our render function. We're just going to make the whole display white. And then we're just going to draw some text that says party menu goes here. And that's about it. So once you're done copying that down, let's go back to pause menu.py and we're going to import that. So from states.party, let's import our party menu class. Inside the update function, let's write some code that handles what happens when the player wants to select one of the options. So we're going to check to see if they press the action one button, which will be like the select button. And then we're going to use this function transition state, which we'll make very shortly. So now let's go ahead and make a function that's going to handle what happens when we press on one of the options with the cursor. So we're going to scroll all the way down. I'm going to go ahead and call this function transition state. And this is how it works. So we're going to check to see what option the index is. So if we put in our index, which is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, then it's going to check to see what value it is. If it's party, then we're going to create a new state, and it's going to be a party menu state. And then we're going to enter that state by placing it on top of the stack. Same deal we've done before. For all the other options, I'm just going to do a pass for now. I'll leave those up to you. That way this video doesn't go on too long. The only really tricky option is this exit option. So remember, let's say we're at the party menu. It's going to be all the way at the top. But if we want to go to the exit, which is the title screen, we have to go all the way to the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to continually pop the stack until we only have one thing left in it. And because we put the title screen at the very beginning, we know it's the first element in our stack. So we'll just go from there. This is a good workaround, but there might be some situations when you make your game where a stack is not the best way to handle your states. So to do that, you can either make a custom state manager, or maybe you can even use a dictionary and point directly to the states you want to go to. There's different ways to do it. There's no right or wrong way. Just play around with it and have fun. So now our game should be working as intended. So we're going to go ahead and run the game.py file and just make sure everything works the way we think it should. So we start in the title screen. When we press enter, we're taken to the overworld and we can move around as we wish. And when we're ready, we're going to press the enter button again. And this will take us to the menu. We can go around. If I press on items or magic, nothing's going to happen. But if I press P on party, we're taken to the party menu. And then if I press O to go back, we're taken right back. And then finally, if I press O, we can go back to the game. Or if I press P on the exit, it takes us back to the title screen. So as you can see, everything's working the way we want it to. So that's all for this video. I hope you found some value in it. And if you did, please be sure to leave a like, a comment, and maybe even consider subscribing. Making games and tutorials is a passion project of mine, so I love to make this stuff whenever I have time. I hope you stay safe and you take care.